All right, here we are. Here we are. Josh Slocum, welcome back to Conversations with the Voice of Reason. Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, I think we spoke two years ago, maybe three, uh, but we did we did have like a little group chat about a year ago. Yeah, yeah, we did. I think I think when when I was on your show, it was a, almost two years ago. Okay. Well, there we go. Time flies. Yeah. Well, has anything happened in those last two years? No, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> The world has gotten better. Nobody is transing anymore, and uh, Cluster B is no longer an issue. Oh, did you finally <laughs> dispel Cluster B from? Western I solved it. Yeah. Country. Okay. Wow. Okay. I just told pe- I just told everybody to stop it. Oh, you didn't give them like a panacea or something like that, or a placebo? no? I just said stop it, and everybody stopped being a Cluster B. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. What year did you graduate junior high? What year did I graduate junior high? Yeah. Um, I have to do the math on that. That would be 1988, oh, maybe. Oh, okay. Okay, you're a little bit uh, before me. Do you remember those uh, middle school dances? Yes. You went to them? Some of them, yes. Were there any songs that really stuck with you? Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, that's the time of life when you're really into music, you know, and you always remember that the music from that time yeah what, what was your music though like the cure uh but whole i only pre- i pretended in high school to like the cure to be popular with the theater set oh. but i didn't actually like them oh okay <laughs> my i was I, um i'm very very basic um i i am a top I was and well no I'm not even going to lie. The music of your of your adolescence is the music that stays with you the rest of your life. I am I am fully top 40 commercial 1980s pop. Okay. That's my music. Paul Abdul, Janet Jackson. Correct. Do Michael Jackson, yeah. George Michael, yeah. Wham, oh. Madonna, Cyndi Lauper. Uh yeah. Yeah, basically whatever was on the top 40 between 1983 and 1990 is my music. Okay, but where is all the glitter and the eyeliner? Why why have you stuffed that away? I mean, you're so clean cut now. All these earthen tones. Like well, no, I, I, ha- do you I have a to keep... on under the table. That's cheeky. <laughs> 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 don't you think there's enough glitter in the world we don't need okay. more glitter do okay. we yeah well right? i don't know yeah well i mean if that was the uh the music aesthetic when you're coming of age but you've grown out of the aesthetic but the the music still yeah oh you want to know my aesthetic at that time it was um all black from stores like oak tree chess king do you remember any of these clothing these stores for Matt? Yeah, these are okay. East Coast. I don't these. <laughs> Wait, where are? How old are you? I'm 48. I am 46. So you're two years ahead of me. Okay, so we're we're almost complete contemporaries. Yeah, okay, yeah, different coast though. Uh, you, you grew up outside of what? Uh, Philadelphia, Boston. Outside of Syracuse, New York, New York State, okay. middle of New York State. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm. Uh, well, Northern yeah, California, lots so. of. St- Right, right. Yeah, I, I lived in California between five and ten, but my adolescence was back in New York State. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, a lot of things have happened. A lot of things have happened. Um, and none of them good um, since we talked. Okay, since we talked. Not since junior high, but since in the intervening two years since we spoke. Yeah. We don't have time to talk about all the bad things that have happened since junior high. Okay, I mean, well, yeah, you, you, no. There's just okay. not time for that. Okay, but, but the, the moral arc of the universe is bending towards shit. Is that what you're saying? Like, yeah, the false moral arc that doesn't exist is bending towards shit. Correct. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and yeah. what stands out most for you in the last two years that have been uh, the attractor for your concern and criticism? The push by public schools, one of, one of the major concerns, and this is a big concern for us this week because of what's going on in Vermont, um, which is alarming. Um, the, well, the transing of children is, is probably my primary concern. As you know, the show Disaffected is about looking at society, looking at politics and culture 
from a psychological perspective. And you, as you know, I concentrate on, on the, the kind of abnormal psychology that's usually referred to as cluster B personality disorders, narcissism, unstable borderline personality disorder, that sort of thing. And, and of course, as you know, my thesis is that these abnormal psychologies, which are common to domestic abusers, are common to abusive parents, abusive spouses. They're things that, if we know about them, we experience them in the home. They have now become mainstream and normalized. So we have entire swaths of society who, who either are, apparently, cluster B personality disordered, or the, the bigger majority of people are operating in a cluster B dynamic. And, and another way of saying that is we are operating in society as grown-ups as if we are in a domestically abusive home. Okay. Um, uh, but children are paying the highest price for this. Um, have you heard about the horrendous bill that just passed the House in Vermont? I, you probably haven't because very few people have. I think our show is the only one uh, that actually analyzed the bill and told the truth about what's going on in it. We released a special uh, episode, just a little 15-minute episode this past Tuesday uh, going over the bill. House Bill 89 in Vermont. Uh, Benjamin, you're familiar, I think, with bills that states like California have put in place that would make the state something called a sanctuary state for transgender children. Yeah. Right. You're familiar with this. Yes. OK. For for audience members who are not familiar, California recently passed a law it's, um, that is in violation of the U.S. Constitution. It tells California agencies, cops, courts, social workers that they may not cooperate with subpoenas and legal enforcement orders from courts outside the state of California if those courts are attempting to get back or prevent a child in California from being subjected to the transgendering process. Um, and they framed this as, you know, our state is a welcome home for these poor transgender children who can't get the gender affirming care they need. Um, but what it is, is it's actually just making the state of California into a wood chipper with an open door and funneling the kids directly into it so they can get their bits cut off. Vermont has gone farther. Oh. I am s astonished at the depravity of this bill. House Bill 89 just passed our House. It's now on its way to the Senate. We are doing everything we can here in Vermont to make this a painful and uncomfortable process that sparks controversy because we want to stop the Senate from passing what the House passed. Here's what the bill does. It does everything that the California bill did. It tells the uh, state agencies don't cooperate with court orders from other states. Do not extradite even if there's a court order from another state. Uh, do not give information to a law enforcement officer from another state if, if the child has been brought into the state because they, quote, need gender affirming care. Vermont has done all of that. They duplicated all of that in their bill, but they went further. This bill... And it says this in this language, it creates a right under state law. It calls gender affirming care a right, a legal right in the state of Vermont. Uh, of course, the first question anybody might ask is whose pocket is going to be picked to pay for that right? Oh, and the yeah. answer to that is the taxpayers. Um, and they have bundled in the issue of transing children into a section of law that deals with abortion access. Oh. And this is deliberate. Vermont is an overwhelmingly liberal progressive state. The vast majority of, well, I can't say the vast majority. I can say the majority of Vermonters really care about, they want women to be able to have abortions. I'm not taking a position as I talk to you on the issue of abortion largely, okay? That I'm not interested in doing that. I don't need to do that. I'm simply describing the situation here. Um, it's a very emotional issue. Um, and people who uh, people who advocate for uh, the right to have an abortion are very emotionally invested in it. So in writing this law, they opened up the section of statutes that deals with um, uh, a, a woman's right in Vermont uh, to to get an abortion without being interfered with legally. Yeah. And they snuck in gender affirming care as part of the definition of what this law calls legally protected health care activity. 
Okay. Legally protected healthcare activity. So now gender affirming care, that is the transitioning is considered a legally protected health care activity is now considered a right. So this is so, all based on the assumption of bodily autonomy. Yes, but um, uh, bodily autonomy uh, for women, um, but also, how do I express this? Not bodily autonomy for children. Uh, children are served up as meat as surgical meat for the whims of their parents or social workers now in the state if this law passes you know my child my child needs gender affirming care my child is 10 years old and is transgender my child needs puberty blockers my child needs cross-sex hormones vermont will if this bill passes welcome these people in so what's going to happen here's what's going to happen i i use a i'm going to i'm going to use a made up story but there are real stories about this we know of custody cases where two parents are getting divorced and one parent wants to transition the child while the other parent does not we also know that in about 98% of these cases it is the mother who wishes to transition the child and the father is trying to stop it because yeah. this is transitioning children is a woman's moral sin in our in our era um, it's a wickedness that, that is specific mostly to women. Um, men abuse in other ways, but this is female typical abuse now uh, in abuse of households. So let's say that we have a couple named Bob and Jane. Uh, they have a son named Billy. So it's Bob, Jane, and Billy. Let's say that Bob, Jane, and Billy live in Idaho. Um, where if it's not already illegal, it's about to be illegal to transition a child. So let, let's assume they live in a state where it is illegal. There are already states that have banned this practice. They're getting divorced, Bob and Jane are. Jane decides that Billy, their 10-year-old son, is a girl and needs gender-affirming care. So on her weekend, or, or do, no, not her weekend, of course, dad. Dad is the one who gets one weekend a month and mom gets the rest of the time. How silly of me to think there was any um, equity. Um, so when Jane has Billy during her time, she decides to take a trip to Vermont. And then she doesn't want to leave Vermont because now she's in a sanctuary state where little Billy, who was denied life-saving care, the life-saving castration, yes, this is what people call this, um, he was denied that in Idaho, but here in Vermont, he will be protected. So what the state law will do is she won't be extradited, even if the family court in Idaho issues a, a writ demanding extradition. They will not cooperate. Under state law, they are barred from cooperating. They are barred from even providing information about the physical location of the child, okay? Um, it is absolutely incredible, but here's where it goes farther. Oh. This, this law creates a new category that it calls abusive litigation. Abusive litigation is defined as any legal effort to prevent a person from getting legally protected health care activity. So let's say that with our, our family of Bob, Jane, and Billy, the son, Bob goes to the family court and says, help me, my wife, who I am divorcing, is trying to transition our son. She's in the state of Vermont. So the family court issues an order saying, enjoining Jane from doing this to the child. Yeah. Um, Vermont won't cooperate. He can't, he won't be able to stop it happening. If he, if Bob sues Jane, if he, if he launches a civil suit against Jane to stop her, Vermont defines his launching of that suit as abusive litigation. So it is abusive for him to try to stop Jane medically abusing the child. This is the reversal. I talk about this on the show all the time. This is common to narcissism. You reverse the truth. Saviors become victims um, and vice versa. It is absolutely through the looking glass. It's cuckoo. Um, what we discovered is that in our house, in the House, in, in our legislature, Senate and House, our House has 150 seats. To give you an idea of how overwhelmingly progressive liberal Vermont is, out of 150 seats, only 38 of them are held by Republicans. Of that 38, 24 of them voted in favor of this bill. And we believe they have no idea what they voted for. We believe they were lied to. 
We believe that they uh, that it worked, that they saw this as a bill protecting a woman's right to abortion. And they did not look they did not look more deeply to see that this also affects children. Um, and they were hornswoggled. Now, of course, um, I also highly doubt that the, many of these legislators actually read this bill line by line. I did. Had they read this bill or line by line and had they had someone to help them understand the legal construction, I have to believe that many of them would not have voted for this. But they did. And we want to know why. OK, so it uh, so in your state. It goes from the House to the Senate, and it passed the House, and now it's in the Senate. Is that how? Yeah, it is. It okay. is a, cor- that is correct. And then, uh, so where is it? Where's the bill in the great process of democracy? The bill, uh, it, it, it's it, the bill is passed the House. It is waiting to be introduced into the Senate. Okay, and we expect that it will be introduced very soon. We do not have a date. They don't announce ahead of time the dates on which they will introduce bills. Oh, clever of them. And the Senate is mostly Democrat, but how mostly? Uh, uh, I can't tell you off the top of my head. Um, Big majority, but I I don't have that figure to hand. Okay. And what is the strategy um, if it does go into practice, if it goes into law? uh, You said it's unconstitutional. It, it is. It's, it's unconstitutional. This isn't controversial, right? I, I'm actually, I, I'm, I'm disgusted and angry that I have to explain this to people. I have to explain this. Am I allowed to swear? Yeah, I already said shit, so you're good. Okay. I have to explain this to fucking lawyers, okay? And I should not have to explain this to lawyers. I am not a lawyer, but I know how to read statutes and I understand legal and statutory construction from 20 years of doing this professionally. This is squarely against the Constitution. Which part? The part that says do not cooperate with law enforcement or investigations by out-of-state courts. What part of the Constitution does it violate? Article 4, Section 1, known as the Full Faith and Credit Clause, that says all states must honor the legal proceedings. I'm not quoting verbatim. I am paraphrasing, but I'm doing it accurately. All states must respect the legal proceedings of other states and engage with them reciprocally. You are not allowed in our system. This is our Constitution. This is the United States. States may not opt out of this compact. This is not legal. They can't do this. They're doing it, but it's absolutely unconstitutional. So you ask, what is the strategy? It's going to have to develop as it goes along. What we at Disaffected are trying to do right now is get the word out. We've emailed all the Republican senators who voted for this. We've sent them um, a link to the show. We have heard through the grapevine. No, Nobody will yet stick their hand up because if they do, then we're going to know which of them voted for this. And, and now feel bad about it. Nobody wants to take responsibility. So oh. I don't know. But we've heard through the grapevine that just this morning, one Republican left a committee hearing in absolute fury over having been deceived about this bill uh, and that this person had no intention of voting for this kind of legalized child abuse. OK, um, so, so how exactly we were they deceived? Do you know that they were just it was... I am guessing yeah. I'm guessing from experience with the legislative process, my guess is here's the problem most lawmakers don't have the time to to read line by line every single bill that they are asked to vote on that is a that's an actual structural problem i don't know how we solve it but it's a very big problem um my guess is they were told by their aides uh they were given an executive summary that did not point out correctly what was going on they probably relied on an interpretation from an aide or you know some council digest or something like that that is my guess okay and do you know who's behind this bill who wrote this uh we do know who the sponsors are there's a raft of sponsors all progressives and democrats is about um i can't name them off the top of my head but i can see the picture of their caucus it it was about 10 or 11 progressive uh democrat sponsors Okay, and do you, had, have you uh, looked at their meetings or, or seen how they wrote this? What is who's lobbying them to do this? I have not yet had a chance to do that. This this uh, this just uh, we just learned about this this week. Oh wow! So, okay, so it just kind of yeah. arrived. How did you find out about it then? 
Um, I don't remember. Uh, I was alerted to it by someone. I can't remember who it was who alerted me. Some email or something like that, and he looked into it. And it's under mm-hmm. the abortion, yeah. under the abortion bodily autonomy. Well, I guess they don't say bodily autonomy, but the legal protections around abortion. Yep. So yep. why isn't it obvious that abortion would lead to this, like legalizing bodily autonomy over the unborn child? Why wouldn't it extend to the uh, the modification of the child post-birth? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I know what you're doing. I know why you're asking. Well, it. I'm just wondering, uh, at what point did Pandora open the box, right? At, at what step? <sighs> It, it it's hard to say i'm having to reevaluate everything i thought i knew about the world and politics even just 5 or 6 years ago as you know i used to be a liberal and i used to be somebody who who you would call woke i am not any longer yeah. um but all of this stuff passed me by in most of my adult life that i was a liberal and uh, well, I'll just I'll just come right out and say it. I'm not trying to be coy about anything. I don't have a final answer on the question of abortion. I do not I do not think that all abortion should be banned. I am sympathetic to women uh, who have been raped when there are cases of incest. Obviously, when the mother's life is in danger, I am in fact sympathetic to their to their perceived need for abortion. I do not want to see all ab- abortions banned. But I am far far less supportive of abortion as a whole than I was a few years ago. In our state, Benjamin, there's no limit on when you can get an abortion. You can get an abortion on the last day of the ninth month. Oh, okay. They've made it perfectly clear. Is there that live birth abortion thing, like where it's a few hours after the birth? Is that going on yet? I, I know there's rumors of it. I, I, I okay. can't confirm. Right. Okay. I can't tell you that. I don't know. Okay. and But that's under the assumption that a woman has power over her body and therefore the extension of her body, which is her children. Uh, Yeah. Thank you for saying that. This is a major problem in our society right now. The lack of under the lack of acknowledging that children are not property, that they are their own individuals. They are people. They are humans. Your child is not your property. I'm getting really sick, and I'm hearing this from conservatives as well as from liberals. Parental rights, parental rights, parental rights. I hear it just as much from conservatives as I hear it from liberals. You know what I don't hear? Parental responsibilities. Parents don't own their children. Parents have a moral duty to shepherd and protect and mold their children. They do not have a chattel slavery property interest in their children. Yet liberals and conservatives in this country act as though parents do. So people say, "Mm, but this is my decision as a parent. No, no, ma'am. You do not have the right as a parent to make a decision to mutilate your child. No. But the inverse, no. the, the inverse uh, can hold true then that the parent has no right to tell a child that they aren't a boy or they aren't a girl. No, no. The inverse does not have to hold true. No. Well, if, if the child's their own property, then, then the child's body is the child's own property. So the child should be able to have autonomy and agency with regard to their development, their puberty. No, those two things don't follow. Okay. So how does it not follow that a child can't decide what puberty they want to go down if they're their own property? Who's to tell them what to do or what not to do with their own body? Okay, okay, we're doing devil's advocate. Okay, I get it. Um, I'm sorry, it's, it's, I get it, I get it. It's just so obvious to me I'm having a hard time responding. No, I think it's, um, it needs, these obvious things need to be said because yeah. we've forgotten the obvious. We, we can't appeal to common right. sense anymore. Right. We cannot appeal to it. We have to rebuild it from the ground you're right. up. You're right, you're yeah. right. Okay, so let's rebuild it. Um, I am not saying, and no sensible person that I know of is saying that children... We're not proposing that children are adults. We're not proposing, children are human. Children have a right to bodily integrity. They have a right to be free from abuse. They have, I'm, and I'm speaking of moral rights. I'm not referring to the constitution. I'm not referring to man-made statutory law. I'm talking about moral rights, inherent human moral rights. 
Children have a right to be protected from this. They do not, under our legal system, nor under any sensible moral or legal system, they do not have the right to do whatever they want um, that will harm themselves. Parents do have a right to protect children from their own bad choices, not just a right, an actual deep moral responsibility. So, for example, we already know this. This isn't controversial. So let's all remind ourselves of what we already know because we're forgetting things we knew yesterday. We already know that it's not okay for children to smoke cigarettes. We have laws that ban selling cigarettes to children. We already know that it's not okay to let an eight-year-old drive an automobile because an eight-year-old is not cognitively developed sufficiently to safely drive an automobile. That is why we have laws that restrict licensing to 16 and up. We know that children don't have the cognitive capacity to make serious decisions about altering their bodies, which is why we have laws that say you cannot tattoo somebody under 18, and why we have laws that say you cannot get your ears pierced beneath the age of 18 without your parents' written permission. This is what I'm talking about. We all know this. Every single person watching this, this right now knows this. So if you've forgotten, remind yourself. Now, laws against tattooing underage kids, laws against um, piercing their ears, but it's completely fine to mutilate their genitals, to give them drugs like Lupron, which are used for cancer and are also used as literal chemical castration for sex offenders to prevent the hormones that lead to sexual arousal. So we're going to give these kids puberty blockers. We, this is our new normal, folks. We now have a concept called blocking puberty. Do you like 2023? Are you happy? Welcome to 2023. That's become normal. So it's normal now to block children from developing during puberty. And it's also normal, and it's not abuse, and it's life-saving, and it's loving. To follow those puberty blockers with cross-sex hormones. So if it's a boy giving him female levels of estrogen, or if it's a girl giving her male levels of testosterone. The result of doing this is permanent sterility. Not, and I think people misunderstand this. Let me be uh, let me not say let me be clear because that's such an obnoxious phrase and I apologize to every viewer. <laughs> um, and I just lost my train of thought. What was let, I going to say, Let's be Benjamin? explicit about uh, sterility. Yeah. This is not temporary loss of fertility. Not. This is permanent for the rest of your life. Sterility. Permanent. You may never change your mind. You may never, you will not have the ability to have children now because of something that your parents claim is your real identity and that you may claim is your real identity as a 14-year-old, a 15-year-old, a 16-year-old. This makes no sense. It contradicts everything we do in every other area of life and everyone knows it. Well, everyone knows it. There's got to be something about it that does make sense for the people who are, uh, you know, doing everything in their power uh, to allow it to happen. And they're not all, even if they Why are misguided, there? there's got to be some sort of moral imperative that they're following through. And it can't just be pure evil. They, they know themselves Why? to be good. Why? Uh, because... Because even people who are doing the wrong thing are always operating under some sort of assumption that they're doing good. So if we can't get into their heads and really understand their mythological framework from which this appears to be true, I don't see how we can reach them. Um, and they have more power and they have the tenacity that the opposition doesn't. They will show up day in and day out and sit through these insanely boring eight hour meetings with a little bit of struggle session peppered through just for, you know, shits yep. and giggles. Right. So these people yeah. are highly dedicated to their entire moral framework. They want to give, they want to deliver children from the evil that is the wrong sex, from the evil that is right. Maturity. Yes. Yes, I think you're right that that is – that's what's animating. Because people believe a fantasy now. Many people, uh, leftists, believe a fantasy. They be What fantasy do they – well, they believe in many of them, but let's start with the basic one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's start with the biggest fantasy lie that the left believes. Ready? 
that there's such a thing as being born in the wrong body and that you can be a sex but be the other sex. That's... That's not, it's not, I'm not even going to call it a lie. It's just ridiculous. It is equivalent to saying water is both a liquid and a solid. Gravity means that you fly off the face of the earth and aren't tethered to anything. It's, it is to say when the sun comes out, it's dark outside. That's how ridiculous it is. It's not even wrong. Okay. It doesn't even make philosophical sense. Well, how does it hold water then? We've already all gone through this before, but I mean... Well, because we've been, we've been prepped. Uh, we have been prepped culturally, yeah. at okay. least since the 1960s. Uh, okay. And I realize that there are antecedents. I understand. Yes, I understand. It didn't all happen. I can already hear the comments coming in. I hear you, and I stipulate your point. Um, but the 60s did appear to be a turning point where things accelerated. Um, you know... Free to be, you know, anything you want. Love is love. Da, 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 da. Freedom, you know, down with the man, down with its conventional structures. They're just holding us back from self-actualization, man, yeah. right? Well, and yeah. some, of, some of that, some of that is just normal in a culture, right? Young people are going to come up with new ideas. Generations sometimes come along and say, I don't want to live in a world like the, like the world my parents lived in. Some of that sentiment is normal. I no longer think that most of what happened in the 60s was anywhere near normal or had any precedent in human history. It, it became so extreme. And we have marched along decade after decade. Um, like, for example, I was wrong. I, for, there, for, this is, goes back to what you opened up uh, this conversation with when you talked about the moral arc of history. Yeah. I used to believe in the moral arc of history. Of course, it's entire bullshit. There's no such, there's no teleology. History isn't going in a direction, right? Um, we're not bending toward justice, um, and, I'm not, and we're not necessarily bending toward injustice, but there is, there's no moral arc of history. I used to believe there was, and I believed that, that we were on the right path in the 1980s. Started in the 70s, um, but continued through the 80s. Um, let children be. It's okay if boys like fancy things. It's okay if girls are tomboys. I approved and yeah. still approve to some degree of that sentiment. I don't want to police children. I don't think we should be policing them. I think we let them naturally do what they want to do safely. We don't naturally let them cut their bits off. Okay, so let's let's all stay anchored to reality. We, you know, we let them choose the toys they like and, and things like that. Um, and I thought that we were getting to a place in society where we could accept that a certain percentage of boys and girls will turn out to be homosexuals and that a certain percentage of boys and girls, often usually overlapping with homosexuals, but not 100 percent, that a certain percentage of boys and girls would be, quote, gender atypical tomboy girls and sissy boys. Yeah. I believed that we had conquered the excessive fear of that and the tamping it down and that we could allow children to just naturally be. I was wrong. Huh. We did not actually do that. We said we did, but clearly we didn't because look where we are. What this is, this is transing away the gay. That is true mostly with males um the detransit the more detransitioners i speak with i see a different pattern than what's replicated in in the data or in the talking points that okay. people use on the data what There's do you a see a lot of heterosexual women who are now detransitioning who were never lesbians um the the right. females and male path towards transition is actually um dimorphic along sex lines you're if right you can believe if you can believe that um <laughs> which is odd and, i refuse uh, to believe it uh, i know it's hard um, it would make me a bad person to believe it benjamin <laughs> but about about um homophobia uh the fear of the sissy boy um and and i think that it was a misstep i i still have the contention that it was a misstep politically for the gay rights campaigns to popularize the concept of homophobia because it it i think it's i the, agree it's the wrong term because maybe that fear or that disgust or that dislike yes. of that is a vestigial aspect of cultures that don't have a lot of free time, don't have 
infinite resources. And so when we are in the land of bounty and plenty, we can relax the norms that we exert on the males and the females because we don't need them necessarily to reproduce. Now we've gotten so far, we've been blinded, we've gotten high on our own supply to such an extent that now nothing really means anything because we're not tethered to reality in a lot of ways. And actually we loathe, we're reality phobic in a lot of ways because it demands it demands that we become men. It demands that we become women. It demands that we get old, right? Like, look at Madonna, right? She, she doesn't. <laughs> Must I? Well, okay, don't. But you, you can already <laughs> you can picture her in probably two states. One is the expired Twinkie, and one is like the nubile uh, woman. Yeah. <laughs> but we we uh, I think that the progressives are on a uh, they're they're trying to if if I try to look and and internalize their morality what they're trying to do is is reach an escape velocity from the authority of reality ultimately from yes. god but but you don't have to go into metaphysical just like material reality they want to live in a virtual reality where the will where where reality follows the will where everything is based on consent and choice and where we're running up against right now with the child transition is under how do how does their ideology work when it's affecting or being affected by children who aren't developed yet? And maybe it's because they fetishize the Garden of Eden. They want everybody to be undeveloped. They want the child to remain a child. And so if they stop the process yes. of manhood or womanhood, then the child is free. They're liberating child uh, from, from reproduction. Yes. And they're liberating the planet from more human beings. Yes. Yes, I agree with everything you just said. I agree with. Um, I think your analysis is correct. Uh, um, but what what's insidious about this is, and you're right, they that people, most people, do believe even when they're doing wicked things. You are correct that most people believe they're doing the right thing or they're doing a good thing. I I will not accept all people. Um, that's not okay, true. Okay, yeah, there yeah. are psychopaths out there. Um, and, and it's possible but, yeah. to do good without believing that you're doing good to, to kind of yes. even just back away from the assumption that what I'm doing is good or bad. I mean, maybe not yes. bad, but good, you know, I can do good work, but leave history to judge me. Right. Yeah. Having a humble yes. relationship to that. Well, what, what's awful about this is that the, that the people who are doing this, um, and the ones who believe that they're doing something loving for their children or for children in general, yeah. They say they're doing this to liberate the children, but that isn't true. They're doing this for themselves. They're not conscious of it. Many of them are not conscious of it. Okay, I'm what's not that saying blind spot then. Yeah, it, the human unconscious. Freud talked about it. Okay, right? this is projection. This is huh. for these adults. For in my view, for most of these adults, they are externalizing their own inside psychological. Rough spots, insecurities, um, yeah. defense mechanisms against the, the the fear of the world, right? Yeah. But they're expressing it. They're taking it out on children, right? They're using children to express it. Um, and I know that they have convinced themselves. I understand they've talked to themselves and they've said, I'm doing something wonderful for Billy. But they're not. It doesn't matter if they feel that they are. They're not. I wanted to say something. Oh, there's two other things. Yes. You, so Fractal. many things you there so go. many things you you put on the table here. Um I got to get a pen. A cornucopia of conversation something. topics. Yeah, of something. So yeah. so two of these. Um um the Okay, so we talked about the fact that people think they're doing good. Yeah. Homophobia. I want to pick back up on that. I'm really glad you brought that up. I was just having a conversation with members. Disaffected has a, a private Discord chat server for show supporters, and mm -hmm. I'm in there a lot. So we, ha we have a lot of conversations, and um, mm -hmm. it's, it's just a really good spot. And I was just talking with people yesterday about... I'm encouraging people to stop using the term homophobia as freely as they are using it. Yeah. Um, and it has been so widely adopted that conservatives 
almost as many conservatives use homophobia as freely as leftists do. It's almost as... The ratchet is just on left, yeah. Yeah, it's gone that far. A couple of things. Number one, there are some people, there are not many of them, they're a really small percentage of the population, but there are some people who probably actually fear and actively hate homosexuals. That exists, right? It's this many people, okay? There are many more people who are emotionally uncomfortable. They may not know why. They may not be able to express exactly why, but they're uncomfortable with it. There are other people who say, I don't think this is right. It doesn't comport with my religious beliefs. I don't think it's a healthy way to live, but it is not my job, nor is it my place to either tell other people how to live, nor is it my place to agitate for laws that will restrict their enfranchisement and rights, right? That's a respectable position. I have many conservative, I have many Catholic friends who feel that way. And these are the people who say, love the sinner but hate the sin, and who actually mean it. It's not an excuse. These people respect me and have feelings of affection for me, and I for them, right? The fact that they think my homosexuality is in some way a negative thing does not mean that they hate me. And it you, doesn't mean that they don't love me. And you respect them by keeping the leotards under the table. Great. Well, I'm doing it right now. Yeah, we'll see. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> you meet them halfway. So there's mutual respect. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You're not yeah. going to you know, flaunt it in their face, do yeah, a pride but, parade. But this is what I want people to understand. Right? That yeah. that's, that's really real. So homophobia. We have got to stop treating everything that doesn't basically kiss homosexuality's ass in public as hatred and phobia. Stop it, right? There is a huge obvious difference between hatred and violence and simply not liking a person or not agreeing with a person or even thinking that a person is very spiritually misguided, as many people do. That's not hatred. It's not pho- It's not an irrational hatred. It's not a phobia. Even disgust. This is here. It, Here's something for the listeners and viewers yeah, to really here chew on. Yeah, here we go. Say there's a guy out there. Let's call him, I don't know, Cake maker Todd. Sam. Okay, cake maker Todd. <laughs> Todd, uh, cake maker Todd, okay? Cake maker Todd. <laughs> I, had to I feel so bad. <laughs> I know who you're talking about, and, I, and I'm on that guy's side. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, cake maker Todd hates gay guys. Absolutely hates them, right. is disgusted by them, is actually disgusted, gets that nauseated. I cannot even imagine two men being sexually intimate. Just finds it absolutely disgusting. Guess what? That's not violence, and it's not an irrational fear. His disgust is not necessarily an irrational fear. Okay. It might be, but it might not be. Yeah. At, oh, and here's something juicy, too. You mentioned this a few minutes ago. I think it is very plausible that evolution, biological evolution, has left us with psychological remainders that do give people an eh response to things like homosexuality. Yes, I do think that's very plausible. This may in fact be part of the remnants of our instinctive behaviors that come from our evolutionary past. Well, I mean, if we reproduce to get here, it would make some sort of sense that homosexuality would be seen as a dead end for reproduction. Because it yeah, is. Correct. Because in, in you know, unless, except in case of special technological circumstances, it is in fact a dead end for reproduction. Yeah. Or uh, Now, surrogacy. of course... You know, gay people or people people who would prefer to have sex with their with members of their own sex because we didn't always conceive of people as having an identity as gay or straight. Yeah. Obviously, throughout history, many of those people partnered, coupled heterosexuality, and had children anyway. Yeah. Right. I'm not suggesting people should have to do that. I'm describing a reality. Right. Yeah. So it's not that you know gay people can and do and have always had children. Right. Um. It is physically possible for me to have heterosexual sex with a woman. I don't wish to do so, but I can do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, so here's, um, 
I'm going to go um, in a bad direction, so forgive me. But if we do this with homophobia, we kind of have to do it with two other things um, that preceded homophobia, um, which would okay. be racism and misogyny. Um, the, <laughs> right? Um, the policing yeah. of people's attitudes towards other, other races and the policing of people's mm -hmm. attitudes towards the other sex. And the way that yep. America has attacked those two things and then homophobia and now transphobia is one, to ridicule those behaviors and two, to um, re-engineer society, to put, um, to, to mix the races, to affirmative action, to boost certain races. Um, and then with uh, the, the feminist push to put women in positions of power, to, to achieve representation and and to denigrate people who, who you know, the attitudes that would be anti-woman. That racism is different than misogyny, but misogyny is closer to homophobia in that we don't really, in, in rushing to accuse people of misogyny, Mm -hmm. We don't really understand, and we, we kind of lump all of those behaviors into one thing. We don't really understand if there's natural or even um, developmental reasons for men to dislike women or to put women down or to use female phrases towards men as derogatory terms. There might be actually, it might not be evil. It might just be some sort yep. of mechanism that actually is good on a certain level or is natural, let's say, maybe not good. So let me yes. retract good, but natural, but because we skipped over that natural conversation and then feminists have done this with their own bodies with regard to abortion rights and the lionizing of abortion and not really platforming the power of female reproduction, not really platforming respect for the female reproductive process, but rather pushing women casting it all as a decision of choice, casting it all as mm -hmm. the better woman has control over this stuff. The better woman can, can put hormones into her body to mess around with nature because she, her will is more important than her body. So I think this is all yes. of a piece. Racism is a little different except for the legal aspects of it. When we get into civil rights law and the government encroaching upon people's attitudes and beliefs and how that has led us to where we are now. So there's, there's all of a piece. And so when we look at all those different things and we say, okay, this is kind of the liberal project and we want to fix it because it's having some really bad things with the children. How far do we go back? How do we, how do we re-engineer what is the liberal society? What is freedom and restraint? What, how, how do we put state, the individual responsibility and rights into a mixture that by and large causes more good than harm or facilitates the better rather than the worse outcomes. So I brought a lot of things. We can go back down to the child thing or to homophobia or misogyny. Let's go to misogyny. Back to you, Benjamin. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, no, I'm not a misogynist. I'm not a misogynist. Um, uh, yeah, I am. I'm really sick of that word. And I, I, I have a lot. I have a lot of thoughts about that word and that concept. Um, most of what we collectively, we as society, um, either call misogyny or simply accept it when other people call it misogyny is nothing of the sort. It is one of the most overused and abused terms, and I'm tired of it. First of all, there is a difference between sexism and misogyny. Okay. They are not synonyms, but we, are, we as a society are treating them as synonyms. They are not. Yeah. Misogyny means hatred of women. Yeah, or fear. Yeah, hatred. Yeah, hatred yeah, yeah. It's the same thing as homophobia. It's yes, a huge term. Yeah. Not the same thing. One can be a sexist and not hate women at all. One can be a sexist and love women. Women can be sexist about men and not hate men. Right? Women actually display more uh, misogyny than men do by and large if you actually yeah, look I, at social media. <laughs> Pets. Yeah, I, 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 I am that I'm so tired of that word that I I'm 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 resisting I'm resisting using it in any context. Um, but it's it still, seems it's still to me, functional. It's still functional to, to, to make a difference between hating hating women, men hating women or beneficial. I think it's called beneficial or benevolent, benevolent sexism. sexism. Yeah, be benevolent sexism. It's like I, I defer. Right. To women. But again, 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 not. No, separate them. Sexism, not misogyny, not synonyms. Okay. okay. Yeah. Right. And sexism that, isn't this is inherently the point. evil. It's it's noticing a difference and acting accordingly. Yes. 
Um, I, I've been having this conversation on our Discord as well. I've, and and yeah, I'm, I'm that annoying guy who keeps insisting on stopping the conversation and going back to definitions. <laughs> um, and I'm going to keep doing it. Okay. Um, not not to you, but no, I'm all fine, keep doing fine. it in it's, my, it's, in my it's own a, domain. It's a, uh, it's, it's a it's automatic now. political correctness, but I, I can admire it for what it is. You know, it's... it's um, Define your terms. Yeah. Yeah. Define your terms. Be specific. Right. Yeah. These we are operating now when we communicate with words, we are mostly playing emotion games. Now we're playing emotion volleyball. We're not actually communicating with each other. We're not having thoughts. We're not sharing thoughts with each other. We're sharing feelings. We're trying to stoke feelings in another person. We're trying to stoke or suppress certain feelings in ourselves. We're playing an emotional volleyball game. Yeah. I'm tired of it. I don't want to talk about that anymore. I want to okay. talk about what's actually happening. Yeah. And Misogyny has been maybe even more inflated with emotional hysteria, and I do mean to use the word hysteria. Uh-oh. Um, yes, affirmative. I meant it with all the connotations. Um, almost worse than homophobia. Um, and I see it's it, – and I'm not blaming any individual here. Uh, be, women friends of mine who are close to me, who I respect, who are watching this right now, also do this. They immediately default to using the word misogyny yeah. whenever they see a man mistreating a woman. I'm not going to tolerate it. I'm not going to let that pass by. Okay, well, why it's not? It's not hatred. Why not? Because it isn't true. Okay. It's not true. And and the cry of misogyny is a, currently in our current political era is a, is a call for – it's damsel in distressing is what it is. It is something women do. Oh, isn't it? I'm sorry? It's kind of sexed behavior. Oh, it's very sexed behavior. Absolutely. It's very t female typical. Yeah. Um, it is crying out, I'm a victim. A man is hurting me. I'm a victim. A man is hurting me. That is what misogyny does these days. And people freak out. Oh, my God. We're so sorry. You must have felt unsafe. We'll never allow that speaker to say those things in this building again. Oh, we are so sorry that we didn't come over and ask you if you needed emotional support. Oh, can it? Okay. Can it? Okay. But you can <laughs> you see. Know? You can see. Okay. So I've, I've asked a number of women about this. Um, you know, Kelly J. Keene, uh most recently, but I, but I asked this of a lot of the, the women that I speak to about the trans um, phenomena and they're, they're gender critical yeah. or they're critical of the trans phenomena. Gender critical means something else. But I say, well, why is it that women organizations are the ones who are promoting this? And I want, I'm going to open it up on to a bigger question to you because I know you have a lot to say about this, but I just wanted to say that this, uh, what did this, Kelly J. Keene have to say about that? Because I have all the time in the world for her. She's, I saw a little bit of that interview. Yeah. I'm going to watch the whole thing, but I really like she's, her. She's, she's my Madonna. She's my kind of no, woman. Madonna, Madonna, so if, she, if yeah, you're, yeah. hey, Ke Ke Kelly. Kelly J., I know you don't know me, and I'm a gay guy, but you are my kind of woman. Thank you. <laughs> um, so women, um, the, the, active, the way that this activism um, as a mind virus or as a ideology or as pro social programming in order to elicit certain uh, behaviors right away has gone from, it, it's gone from feminism to, uh, to, to the gay rights movement and then to the trans rights movement by, because women in our culture have been conditioned when they hear the word misogyny or racist, they automatically say bad guy, good guy. Go with it. And so you can just replace racism or – so what gay rights did on a political level, they, they took out misogyny and they put in homophobia. The same response from women because the women have <laughs> yeah. been conditioned to do this. And then now trans yeah. transphobia. So not to say that um, – I don't know why women are more susceptible to this sort of social behavior as an activism behavior, as in we're going to go and fight for the downtrodden. Actually, it kind of that does kind of make a lot I of sense. I think we do me. know why. So I just I think that one part of the puzzle is that through the conditioning of the activism from feminism and from the civil rights movement is just that call uh, to help the needy by transphobia, misogyny, yeah. homophobia. Uh, what in brief, what Kelly J. Keene said, she said something pretty interesting about um, uh, I can I can give you a visual example uh, in in your head if you can remember a few months ago there was a beauty pageant and a um, rather uh, overweight male won this female beauty pageant and the wedding <laughs> he won it. do you remember this guy he did a song 
and it was terrible. And then when he gave his speech, he talked about all the <laughs> online abuse. Like, look, I'm a bigger victim. I'm I'm a, more of a woman than you because I'm a bigger victim. He was certainly bigger. And yes. and what you see is all those pretty girls clapping for him and celebrating yep. him. And Kelly Jean Keen said, well, if if. Uh, in 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 a mean girl uh, kind of developmental arc in uh, middle school high school, the prettiest girl in the class will will propose the question. Well, who's the prettiest girl in the class? And she'll pick like the fifth beautiest uh, prettiest girl. She won't pick the second prettiest girl because then there would be a contention for her. But if if everybody uh-huh. agrees, oh, okay, well she yeah she's the prettiest girl in the class. So if if women start to praise men as beautiful as the most beautiful woman, they. Th- they're nothing lost. Like their reproductive capacity is still available for men who are going to choose them, but they get to be on the right side of history while also not actually sacrificing their own uh, reproductive pro- uh, prospects. So there's that. That's, ga- that's, that's an that interesting going on analysis. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's something to that here he, on, on a broad level. Let's, let's take, let's take this out of controversy, right? Oh, for a minute. I don't. I doubt this is going to be uncontroversial. But let's see where you go with this. Okay. <laughs> we are living in a reality-denying era. We are at war with the truth. We're at war with reality. Okay. We don't believe in reality anymore. We don't believe that sexes are real. We call them assigned, like they were arbitrarily chosen. We are incredibly solipsistic and self-absorbed. We are narcissistic as a society. Collectively, as a society, we are intensely narcissistic. But underneath narcissism is brittle insecurity and a lack of a core foundation of who you are as a person. Right. So it is not that we are super confident. We're not. We're, we're in fact, we're, we're as fragile as, as sponge sugar yeah. on we're the like inside the as a society. Yeah. Yeah. And that is why we put this outward display of um, riches and wisdom and uh, being with the right crowd and all these other things. So we're at war with reality and, and we no longer acknowledge reality. Let's acknowledge reality for a minute. Let's talk about who the sexes are psychologically from an evolutionary perspective. I'm not an evolutionary biologist, obviously, so I can only gloss this on the surface. Um, But it is true that men and women on average, and here is where I I use my catchphrase, supply your own, not alls. I will not be giving any further caveats. If you feel like this is targeting you, those are your feelings to deal with privately. I'm talking in general. Or in the comments, if you want. That helps the algorithm. Yep. Yeah. Oh, go go throw a fit. It'll be amusing. Um, in general, psychologically, evolution has shaped men to be more aggressive, more directly confrontational. We are physically much stronger than women. We are the more violent sex. We are the ones who will default to physical violence more quickly to solve a dispute. There is a reason why we send men to war and not women. Well, unless the Biden administration keeps going the way it's going. Women, um, and and everybody, people want, oh, these hoary old stereotypes. Yes, yes, hoary old stereotypes that happen to be just as true and never stopped being true, even though you don't like them anymore. Men tend, on average, to be more interested in systems and things And women tend to be more interested in people and emotions. Now, there's all sorts of overlap. There are all sorts of outliers. I am an outlier. I have many very male typical psychological traits and many very female typical psychological traits. I, too, like things. I like steam engines and kerosene burning appliances and mechanical things and airplanes and um, you should be the uh, administrator of transportation. Fuck Budagog. Yeah, you don't want you don't want me in there though, because I'll take us right back to uh, 1880. We all going to be on steam trains again, honey. Yeah. There so we go. golden age. You know, but I'm but I'm also and Jordan. I love that Jordan Peterson says this of himself accurately, but it it, it also it applies to a man like me. I'm also markedly more emotionally sensitive than the average man. My feelings are hurt much more easily. I'm a sensitive person, right? Um, 
but generally, women tend are the women's ecological niche is building consensus, community, family, cohesion, um, hearth and home, right? No, no, no. I'm not saying women must be restricted against their will to doing nothing but the dishes. I am not saying that. I am saying that women's psychology is the reason why women have tended to hearth and home, not that they have been forced there. Men, on the other hand, um, are more interested in um, defending boundaries of land. Boundaries. Um, you know, you you could, you know, supply a whole bunch of characteristics here. I think where we are today is the female relational style is ascendant. I believe. Contra the feminists who believe that we're living in a patriarchy, I think we're living in something closer to a matriarchy. Women's female relational styles, getting along with people, making other people feel good about themselves, or alleging that you are there to make people feel good about themselves. <laughs> alleging, right? Um, uh, upholding norms of etiquette and who can say what words and who doesn't, almost like enforcing sumptuary laws along class lines. Yeah, yeah. This is women's shit, right? Oh. And this is running our society Would right now. Would you say assumptionary been... laws, just footnote, or assumptionary? Sumptuary laws. I'll have to look that up. Do you know what that means in brief? Yeah. Uh, no, I just made it up. Oh, <laughs> yeah, in, like yeah, in brief, sumptuary laws, you see them a lot in medieval and early modern Europe and England. They were laws that said, depending on what your rank was in the nobility or peasantry, you were allowed to wear this color or not allowed to wear yes. this color. Like, okay. for example, only the sovereign and members of the sovereign's immediate family Can could wear the ermine trim, okay. right? Yeah. Sumptuary laws. Yeah, okay. Um, I believe that we operate by sumptuary laws uh, today, too. You know, you are allowed to say this because you are of this class, but you may not say the same thing because you do not occupy this rung on the ladder, yeah, right? Okay, yeah. We, our society has been thoroughly feminized. We have been thoroughly human resourced. We are being managed yeah. by women who are treating our public world as if it were a crash or a nursery, okay, where everybody has to listen to what mommy says and have the right feelings, and that the most important thing for mommy to do is to shut up anybody who is sticking her hand up higher than the other one, yeah. right? Okay, yeah. That's, I think that women's natural empathy and natural inborn, these, these, can, these are not good or bad traits, for men or women, they are morally neutral traits. They can be harnessed to good yeah. or bad activities, yeah. but they are necessary. They are complementary. And I believe that we need the balance and we need the interplay and the friction, them pushing up against each other. Yeah. We have to have that constantly, but we don't have that now. Women are up here culturally right now. Men are afraid to say shit to women. Unless the man transes himself, then he can uh, Charlotte. Clymer. Then he can say whatever he wants because yeah. he's a he's a lady now. He's he's he, but he's more of a woman than a woman would ever be because he became a woman. She was merely born a woman. I actually I heard that directly out of a guy's mouth on some radio program the other day. I couldn't believe Wait, it. Wait, seriously? It wasn't. I heard it directly out of his mouth. Your, uh, you know. I'm more of a woman than you because I had to work for it. I had to sit there and understand myself and understand what drove me to do these things and really put in the work of examining my priorities and why I was making this choice. And you think you're a woman just because you were born with a vulva? I actually earned it. Yeah. 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 They literally do believe this stuff. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. So what's the what's the corrective to an overly toxically feminized society? What and and you see I, I see glimmers in the right or in the dissident right of men um, trying to tool around with masculinity and trying to recenter masculinity and women yeah. actually I think it's actually going to be women who do a lot of the heavy lifting for this of correcting uh, this. Oh, I think it has to be men. I think, I think, I think women, I'm, I'm, I'm just 
this is a kind of an idea that's kind of becoming to me, but it's going to be women that are going to show that this is where they want men to go. It's, it's women are going to incentivize, incentivize. They're going to, they're going to like an, like an Oracle. They're going to sh- kind of, kind of state the worldview. And then the men are going to enact it. I think that the women okay. are going to work through this. And that's why I really think that women such as Mary Harrington, Kelly J. Keene, Louise Perry, Abigail Fravall, Camille Paglia, Heather McDonald, Heather McDonald, th- those women, they're, they're starting to map some things out. But it's going to be them that are going to kind of give the go-ahead for men and say that we want men. We want men. We need men. And then they're going to convince other women that actually, if you become a woman to these men, these men are going to become men to you. Right. And, and. And I think Jordan Peterson on the other side, like, like trying, what, what is the masculine corrective? But I, that, that's my own opinion, but I wanted to hear your, like, so you think it's going to be men that are going to balance this out or some sort of, uh, corrective. Well, as I'm listening to you, um, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, I'm feeling this out too. I, I, I reserve the right to change my mind. Here we go. Um, We're being feminine here. We're all feely, intuitive. This is how we do, this is how we do things as sensitive men. I know it's it's just so respectful. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, well I'll tell you what I was going to say, but I'm I'm less certain of it after having listened to you. Um, I was going to say that I think I think it, it it it's going to need men are going to need. Men are going to need to stop being so afraid of women. And I know that that is going to sound really ridiculous, probably to some of your your female viewers. Not all of them, but some of them will find that ridiculous. Yeah. Um, they'll say, well, men are the ones raping us. We're the ones afraid of men. I, I got it. I got it, right? I'm not a reality denier. Men are more dangerous physically to women than women could ever be to men. Women have bare far greater reproductive consequences in a sexual relationship than men ever will. Women are vulnerable to male predation. Women are vulnerable to the fact that a pregnancy, absent modern technology, results in 18 years of commitment that a man can walk away from. This is not a symmetrical relationship. Women are at a disadvantage, okay? But um, the fact is that there aren't more rapists and terrible men than there ever have been in history the way modern feminists act like that's true it isn't true it isn't true we're not in a patriarchy women are not being hunted every single day by most men we all know that there is a criminal element we know that there is a sadistic element of the population and i see a lot of that in the in the so-called trans woman uh category yeah but I think men are going to have to st- – men are socially afraid of women. I don't know all the ways that they're afraid. I'm a gay guy too, so I sometimes have to ask hmm. straight guys, tell me what this is like for you mentally because my head is in a different place. But I can see that men are socially terrified of women. They're terrified to say no to women because saying a man saying no to women or, or going farther and saying, you know what, not only no, but why don't you shut up? Why don't you shut up? up and stop trying to dominate the subject and let other people say something that itself what i just said is taken as actual misogyny that's almost on a level of assault to these women women need to learn how to hear no and shut up again and you can tell (laughs) because you've been telling men no and shut up for about 40 or 50 years and you got your way you're like i'm not going to be controversial I know, I know. Well, I, 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 I am who I am. I'm sorry. Um, the, but but seriously, you know, when when I look out, and I believe me, I didn't think I never thought I'd be. <laughs> Ten years ago, me would look at what's happening right now with me sitting here talking to you and saying these things, and would be screaming bloody murder. What kind of psycho did you turn into, Josh? Oh, man. I you, never... This is your go back in time and kill Hitler moment, and you missed it 10 years ago by not offing yourself. By not killing myself. <laughs> exactly. You know? See how I waste opportunities? Oh, geez, um, Josh. <laughs> I, I, I never thought I'd be saying these things either. Yeah. Um, 
because I was a, quote, male feminist most of my life. I'm 48 years old, and my mind didn't start to change until I was 41 years old. So this is still relatively recent for me. I think we I covered this before. Women. Maybe you covered this before. What was the moment? What was the the change? What was the crack? The crack, the, 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 the precipitating the event, yeah. the precipitating event was what I call my divorce of my mother. And I do call it a divorce yeah, yeah. Uh, because it was that acrimonious. Yeah. My mother is severely personality disordered. She has borderline and narcissistic personality disorders, and she's uh, been a child abuser her entire life. Yeah. It took me until, as, as is common for most people who wake up to the reality of their child abuse, it usually comes in middle age. It came from middle age in middle age for me as well. So it was my breaking away from that and, and eventually putting my abusive mother out of my life that for the first time allowed me to consider emotional and intellectual topics that I, was, I would not allow myself to consider before because they were capital B bad and they, they meant I was a bad boy if I believed them. Okay. I was yeah. mentally enslaved, yeah. right? I kept chains on myself in my own mind. And many people are like this. Many men these days are like this. Many women these days are like this. But that was the precipitating event. And once, once I got some psychological distance from that primary relationship, that unfortunately primarily abusive relationship that formed me and formed my personality, once I had distance from that, I could start saying, this doesn't make sense. You know, I've been told my entire life, starting in the home, but then I replicated this by the choices that I made in friendships. Almost all of my friends, most of my life, have been women. Um, many very deep, very loving, very affectionate relationships with women. I've had wonderful, and I still do have wonderful and meaningful friendships with women. But I had almost none with men. Yeah. I was raised in a household where liberal, leftist, feminist, environmentalist, anti-nuclear, uh, pro-welfare state, pro-abortion, this was enforced. This was gospel in my home. This is what I was weaned on. And I did believe it. I wasn't just going along with it. I believed it. I never had a chance to see outside of it and consider another perspective until I felt that I was allowed to think for myself. That's what happened. This is a very inappropriate question, and I'm posing it. it to you because um, I don't know if it was in a recorded conversation or not a recorded conversation, but somebody brought up, and I think he was a homosexual, brought up the uh, the interesting relationship to gay men and their mothers. And it kind of opens up the very naughty question that you're... Could it be the case that mothers gay their sons? They can turn their sons gay by, yes. by introducing them into environment where their orientation is such that, you know, in another right. direction. Have you thought through that? I mean, it's pretty, it's yes, really I personal. Have. Yes, I have. Yeah. What do you think? Oh, it's, that? no, it's, it's, I think it, I think it's a very apt question. I think it's an apt question for society. I think this question needs to be asked and discussed publicly. So thank you for doing it. It's not inappropriate. It's actually direly necessary. In my view, I do not have an answer. I don't know the answer. I'm working through it. I'm muddling through the best I can like everybody else. But I can tell you what I do believe with some confidence. I, okay, I, I can tell you what I, yeah, I can tell you. Look at me, look at me right now, right now. I'm dithering trying not to answer this. I just yeah. saw myself doing it. There is a striking correlation between male homosexuals and having a mother with a cluster B personality disorder such as borderline or narcissistic PD. And because those terms will be less familiar to people, I'll put them in different terms. Same psychology, different terminology. Overbearing, dominant, and meshing, engulfing, and smothering mothers. Mm. Everyone is familiar with those terms. Okay, so if cluster B doesn't do it for you, I'm talking about these kind of mothers. You cannot help but notice this correlation with gay men and their mothers. It's real. It, I'm not making it up. It's not a stereotype. It's real. I cannot give you numbers. Why can't I give you numbers? Because we are not socially allowed to research this. Go find it in the literature. I dare you. I'll sit here and wait. Any of you go out and find it in the literature. Come back to me and tell me what it says. 
Why is this off topic? Why is this the the race IQ question of homosexuality? Why? Be, because because it is a great sin. Because it is a great sin. It is one of the gravest sins socially to suggest that homosexuals are not genetically hardwired to be homosexual. Because we have emotionally hooked the idea of a homosexual self-esteem. We've made it conditional upon believing that it that it is inborn. You're born this way. Right? Yeah. Now, it is still true. I'm going to nuance this a little bit. People are going to have a hard time with this. I no longer believe that homosexuality is always or primarily genetically hardwired. I do believe there's probably a genetic component as there is to every single human trait, right? But I no longer believe that it is as dominant as con- and controlling as most people believe that it is. Um, like a predilection but, that can get switched in an environment that yeah, tells you to not go Yeah, I think there, I, I suspect, I suspect that there are some children, boys and girls, um, with, because we do have inborn temperaments, our personality structure is massively influenced by how we're treated as children, but we do come out of the womb with some predilections, right? Yeah. Some of us are more sensitive than others. Some of us tolerate pain better than others. Some of us are more stoic than others, and these are natural qualities. But these, these are molded and shaped in different directions, and we are susceptible, some of us, I believe, um, to having our sexualities affected by the uh, parental environment that we are brought up in. Okay. Now, I, I have been out as a, as a gay guy since about 12 or 13 years old. Um, I have known a lot of gay men. But, um, Tish. Or <laughs> <laughs> Tish. Sorry, chat. Of all the gay men who I have known enough about to have some inkling of what their childhood was like, I can think of only two or three who do not have a personality disordered abusive mother. Hmm. And when I say abusive, let me clarify. This is something that people have a very hard time with. Abusive does not mean hits and uh, abuse is not a synonym for physical abuse, okay? So people will Especially say- Especially when we're but, talking about female abuse. Yeah, yeah. Let, so let, let, me, let, me, let me take the part of the aggrieved and outraged person who just heard me say that, who wants to defend their gay friends, okay? My best friend loves his mother. His mother is the sweetest woman ever. She is so involved in his life. She's always staying in touch with him. She cares about him so much. They go shopping together. She had him, when she had her third marriage, she let him be the ring bearer, blah, 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 blah. This is very typical, right? She's the best person ever. They love each other so much. Now, that may be true. And she may also be an incredibly manipulative, abusive narcissist who has parentified her child, made him into a confidant and something like a surrogate husband Mm -hmm. because she can't keep a man or any man that she brings into the house turns out to be violent or a drug user or she's a serial monogamist. And so she's turned her child, as my mother did to me, into an adult confidant from from the age of of seven years old, right? That kind of enmeshment, I see it all the time in gay men with their mothers. And yes, I do believe, although I cannot prove this and I can't point you to a study, I do believe that there is a causative influence, not simply correlative, causative. I I can't give you percentages. It could be. I mean, I'm just guessing, and this is probably something that's not useful at all. Um, It would have to be studied in something, but it could be the case that... Somehow women who are, have a predilection towards these personality traits that you're discussing have certain hormonal balances that it's then true. influence the, the fetus yep. in the womb. Because uh, sexuality is Absolutely. highly influenced. Uh, uh, I do know that there's some research re- around lesbianism about a, uh, a high amount of testosterone um, in the womb uh, can, can lead to uh, lesbian uh, orientation later on. So. Yeah. It, it, it makes sense. Um, I, think, I think that we know that 
Well, as you just mentioned, um, um, a, an excess of stress hormones in a pregnant woman can have effects on the fetus. Yeah. So what I'm what I'm saying fit, dovetails perfectly with that. Women with borderline personality disorder, like my mother, a lot right? of stress, a lot of cortisol, maybe. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 So so again, I'm going to complicate this again. We're not thinking yeah, yeah. in black and white. Yeah. We're thinking we're in still actual shades but of we're nuanced. human gray. The best right? place to be with Josh Locum. Yeah. So my mother, all right, I'm not going to talk about her right now as the abuser. She is an abuser. She's wicked. But she was also abused herself. She's also a human being with her own needs and desires. I'm going to talk about her that way, okay? So picture my mother who got pregnant with me at 18 years old. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, my mother came from a dysfunctional, impoverished, alcoholic, and abusive childhood herself, Okay. What she came, what she turned into, she came by honestly. It doesn't excuse anything that she did to her children, but she didn't just pop out of the womb the way she was. Okay, she she was hurt too. Um, the kind of stress that a that a young woman with borderline personality disorder and I I wasn't there obviously I was in the womb so I didn't observe my mother, yeah. but I've talked to people who did who were there. And yes, I do believe that by the time my mother was 18, she she already had the psychological syndrome because it doesn't just pop up. It's something that happens over the course of a childhood and starts to concretize in adolescence. Borderlines are full of anxiety, full of stress, full of morbid rumination, full of self-doubt. Um, they Their cortisol and their adrenaline is pumping all the time into their veins. It's a, it's a very unpleasant way to live. As much as my mother was a terrible person to her children, she has also suffered her entire life. That's yeah. real. Yeah. It doesn't excuse it, but she suffers. She still suffers today. She will suffer, sadly, every day to the rest of her life because she won't change and she's driven off every single person in her life. No family speaks to her. She has no friends because of her behavior. But she was at one time an 18-year-old girl from a broken home with a father who died young and a mother who mistreated her. And there she is out in the world, just graduated from high school. She's pregnant now. My father wouldn't marry her. Imagine the stress that she was under, right? So if, if that is true, yeah. it, it's very easy to see how th there may be that correlation, yeah, that even if we're looking at the hormonal. Down. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, so there is some, um, I don't know how to articulate the criticism of your critique of society. Um, and I don't want to, because I want to no, use it. No, go ahead. Right it's now. fine. Well, um, just uh, using terms that were um, developed within one-on-one -on -one, uh, psychological relationship counseling, right? The therapeutic process was developed in psychoanalytic environment taking those yep. out of that psychoanalytic environment and construing those terms onto society. There's some, pro there's some problems there. There's some problematics there that, um, cause the terms were not created as sociological terms. They're individual personality. Can you be terms. specific? Uh, like borderline personality disorder to say, to say that we are living in a borderline personality disorder, narcissistic society is just ex extrapolating terms that are very, that, that came from a certain dynamic relationship between a therapist and, and his or her clients. And then there's, there's translation difficulties. I don't want to get into them because, but I, but I want to mention that there's difficulties because I want to kind of follow the path of your own critique and propose or to question in a playful manner or in a tentative theoretical manner that mm -hmm. if we are in a abusive relationship, if, if our political environment is just under constant stress, constant neurosis, like everything that you described of your mother, you're describing Twitter and you're describing the political yes. arena. Yes. Is it any wonder if we, if we do say that this kind of personality can lead to uh, alternative sexualities or homosexuality, is it any wonder that more and more kids, like 30% of Gen Z or some insane amount, are identifying as non-binary as gay and queer and the queer and the gay and the non-binary isn't just an identity isn't just them trying to like ha be more important and climb the privilege hierarchy but it's a response mechanism to the end of society like i i don't want to 
be a part of reproducing the society because the society has failed. We're in a failed relationship. I don't want to go through the motions of this. So I'm going to opt out by being queer or non-binary, right? It could be some sort of response. The children could be responding to the stress of our environment and using sexuality. And it's, it's a very shallow sexuality. It's not true sexuality. Right. It's, yeah. I'm yeah. glad you said that because was, that was going to be the first response. So first of all, there's a, there's a, there's there's a, a, an infinite world of distance between the actual reality that somebody subjectively has an erotic attraction to one sex or another. That's a that's a real state that has nothing to do with making a speech assertion that I am queer. Yeah. Those two things are not the same yeah. Yeah. at all. The rainbow right? flag is you know, in your bio is right? not. So, the same so thing. what I would say is most of what they're claiming, they're claiming to be things that don't exist. Things they can't even define themselves, these children, nor can the adults define them. What is queer? They can't define it, Benjamin. They, oh yes, they will give you a lot of words. They will respond with thousands of words, but they won't actually answer that question because they can't. The best definition of queer that, that I can come up with, because you have to read between the lines. You can't take people at face value because they're not being honest. Yeah. They're lying to themselves and they're lying to other people. Thank you, Dr. House. Queer means... I'm in opposition to normal. Yes. I oppose normal. Yeah. That's what queer, like that's all that else. queer means. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. 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 So it's not real. Trans isn't real either. There's not a single person on the face of the earth who is transgender. Th that's never been real. It's not real today and it never will be real. Because why? Because there is no such thing as a person who was born in the wrong body. Yes. Yes. There are people who believe that they were. Yes. There are people who experience subjective psychiatric distress about their body. Yes, there are people who believe that their mannerisms are too feminine or too masculine for the body that they're in and that the only way they can be happy is if everyone else pretends to see them as the opposite sex. I acknowledge that these people are very real. I see them every day. But transgender isn't real. There isn't anyone who was ever born in the wrong body. That's a question that's not even wrong. It's an ill-posed question, as philosophers would say. <laughs> it violates the law of non-contradiction. Well, um, or it embraces it so much that it shoves its head out of its own anus. In right. The so, yeah. like, you, you talked about all these kids identifying as. Yeah. I have a statistic for you from a meeting that I went to last night at uh, an elementary school in Burlington. Uh, th this is another thing. I, we, we won't have time to talk about this um, right now, but it ties in with H89 in the legislature. The Burlington School District has gone full commie, full gender commie. They are enforcing. They are indoctrinating and enforcing okay. everything LGBTQ queer on all the students. I walked into this elementary school last night for a one-hour presentation on the LGBTQ plus 2IASS task force and what they're doing to, quote, ensure the safety and integrity. No, I don't know what integrity means. Or That's their word. Um, yeah. Of our trans students and staff. Yeah. It's just a huge exercise in political compliance. It was a tent revival meeting. But as I walked into this school, I want... Everybody who's, who's listening right now, I want you to picture, visualize in your mind your elementary school. Get a picture in your mind of those long hallways that are cinder blocks, but they're painted in like tan or institution green, yeah, yeah. right? Remember what that looks like. So imagine that you're walking down that hallway and you're looking at the posters on the wall. Most of them are student art. And my mouth was hanging open. There was one that said, well, there's a whole bunch of BLM stuff, so the, the kids are encouraged to, uh, to write about Black Lives Matter. Yeah. There was um, LGBTQ, and then all spelled out, you know, and, and at the bottom, I am queer. And it looked like it was, you know, maybe a sixth grader's handwriting. Um, there are uh, there, uh, collages done by kids. I, I, it's hard to explain this, but like, there was one with two panels. The panel on the left was how things used to be in the past. And the panel on the right was how things are now in society. Yeah. In the past, women didn't have rights, exclam, 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 full of misspellings. Okay. okay? Yeah. Women didn't have rights. Like, ah, ah, women didn't have any rights, blah, 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 how it is today. Women have rights. 
you know, down with, I don't remember if they said sexism or misogyny, but it is literally, these kids are turning out Maoist shit <laughs> and putting it up there. I, I'm not God, joking. I'm sorry to laugh. That's my only adequate I know. Response. I couldn't believe it. And not, a, but the adults are doing it. Benjamin. Yes. I walked in and at the end of that long hallway, I wish, I wish I could, I wish I, I had videoed this because I, the visual hits you emotionally in a way that my words will not. You're looking all the way down at the end of the hall and, and you, you see a huge rainbow flag with that raised black power fist in it. Yeah. That fist that looks like this, yeah, yeah. right? In rainbow colors. And it looks like it's over an altar. It's framed in the center by the door. This is the first thing you see when you walk in to the school. And, and it just goes on and on like that. I'm sorry, I digressed. Yeah. During this meeting, yeah. we got statistics from a survey yeah. that the Burlington School District did of their students. No, I don't have the survey, so I cannot tell you their methodology. They claim to have surveyed 425 students and found that 35% of them say they are LGBTQ. Yeah. yeah. Now, now, that isn't real, okay? That's a speech act. It is telling us information, but it's not telling us the information that they, they would like us to take from it. There are 35% of those children are not homosexuals. And the, o the only... Thing in LGB had a wet dream yet, right? Of course, of course, because they're this is an L, you know, uh, yeah. Sorry, the only thing, the only thing in that whole initialism LGBTQ plus SIA blah blah blah. The only portion of that that's actually objectively real is lesbian, gay, and bisexual, homosexual, and bisexuality. Everything else is false. It's not real. There's no trans, there's no queer, there's no non-binary. These are, these are made up phantoms, right? So these children certainly aren't those things because those things don't exist. But 35% of them sure aren't homosexuals either. These kids aren't expressing actual... I don't even think that they can be said to believe that they are these things because they're too young. Many of them are still too young to actually have experienced sexual desire, right? One would assume. But, but this is scary. Yeah. Why do we have Why do we have school administrators who are literally asking children? They're asking children their private sexual interests. Yeah, yeah I was don't, just in don't a let training that pass for by state audience, of Washington. Right? I was in a training for the state of Washington that encouraged us to talk about the sexuality with children. And there was a picture of a, a grown man and a nine-year-old girl leaning over a piece of homework. Jesus Christ. I was yelling the whole time. I had to leave early. I got too mad. <laughs> but we have to watch it every year. <laughs> you know, the thing. Um, I, not at your expense, but honestly, you saying that you got mad and yelled and had to leave actually makes me feel better because you are so imperturbable and you have such equanimity that I sometimes feel like a whirling dervish around you. I'm like, I need some of Benjamin's chill. Okay, I didn't actually <laughs> yell, but I was very snarky and saying, this is bullshit, yeah. this is bullshit, this is bullshit, yeah. that's bullshit, this is bullshit, that's bullshit. Okay, so... The kids don't know what they're doing. They're being taught this thing. One, if this is an act of rebellion, then, and you said this earlier, every society has a little bit of rebellion in it, that there will be a rebellious spirit to this stuff. And I do hear tremors and rumors of a lot of young kids saying this is a bunch of bullshit. Like, this is just total okay. bullshit, right? So there's that path to it. But there is this... What society does this to its society? What society does this to the children? And we can, there might be some sort of psychological thing to kind of like project onto that behavior in order to find the counter to it. Why are, why are these hyper progressive people? And okay, really easily say they just want to diddle kids. I think that's a little too reductive. There's probably some of that in that. Why do they want to sexualize kids? Because it's a great uh, brain control mechanism. If you can confuse them about reality, then they will always have to believe in what you say. Their, their center of gravity will be in authority, not in their own empirical experience, because you've confused them about their own empirical experience. So it yeah. works for the system. It works for the state. But there's some sort of, how did we get here? Like, these people were probably... Grow, grew up in a not Christian, but Christian behaving households. And now they're doing this to their kids. Here, well, here's, here's what I suspect. 
Um, and again, we have to complicate it um, because it's really easy for people to go off in one direction or another and put all of their eggs in, in one basket or the other basket. I don't believe that most adults who are participating in this, most, not all, but most, I don't believe that most of them are consciously, I don't believe they're aware of what, I don't think they know their own motivations. I think that they believe, most of them, that they're doing the right thing, but that their own motivations are coming from their unconscious. And yes, I am talking Freud here. Yes, okay. I do believe yeah. in the unconscious. Well, yeah, 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 um, yeah. yeah. I, I think their unconscious is completely opaque to them. Uh, it's leaking out in ways that they don't understand. I also don't believe, yes, there are bad actors at the top of the economic pyramid with a lot of power and a lot of money who are who do in, mean intentionally to harm children. Yes, that is real. Whether they intend to harm children because they take pleasure in seeing the harm in children or whether they are merely willing to treat the children as collateral damage callously and not care what happens to them to service another goal makes no difference at all. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I recognize that there are different motivations. Yeah. Yes, huh. there are people like that who are consciously seeding um, activist money in the millions of dollars. Uh, into these efforts to confuse children. We see it in the Pritzkers. There's a, um, mm -hmm. there's a researcher and a writer named, um, and I'm going to unfortunately mispronounce her last name. Uh, I don't mean to, but I always forget it. Her name is Jennifer Bilek or Jennifer Bilek. I yeah. don't yeah. remember how it's pronounced. Uh, she's done a lot of work on this, and she's uncovered a money trail with people like the Pritzker family of Illinois political fame, and some foundations connected to them and to some other very rich uh, millionaires and billionaires uh, who are putting grant money into a lot of these activist organizations that are getting into schools. So that does exist. Yeah. However, I believe the vast majority of adults who are participating in this are not in a conscious conspiracy. They do not see themselves as coordinating activity for an evil end. They think that they are merely responding to the way society is and responding to the needs of children that have arisen naturally. They are wrong, but they don't have conscious malicious intent. Yeah. So I don't believe that there is one coordinated conscious conspiracy, okay? I believe that these things are coming together in a way that has certain effects that look indistinguishable from what you would see in a conscious conspiracy, right? Yeah. That's important. It's subtle, but it's not the same. I think they are doing this, most of these adults. They are treating children like avatars. And I mean like the movie avatar, right? Where you get into a device and there is an image of you, a virtual you, that goes out and does things in a world that you cannot do. They don't think they're doing this, but they are avataring these kids. These children that they claim are queer or non-binary or trans are acting as avatar puppets in the world to shore up something about that adult's own emotional needs or damage. That's what I think. Okay. How do you reach people? Like that. Ah, right. Yeah, we almost, okay. So this is me. I'm only speaking about me and what I intend to do. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be prescriptive about what other people need to do right now. I do that most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will spend no more than a cursory or negligible amount of time trying to, quote, reach people on the left anymore. I won't do it. It's a waste of my time. I'm done with them. I don't want to reach them, Benjamin. I don't care about reaching them. I want to control them. I want to corral them. I want to prevent them by force if necessary, by legal force. I want to prevent them from harming children. I don't give a flying fuck what they think. I don't care if they like me. I don't want to persuade them. I want to stop them. That is all I care about. I understand that other people do want to reach them. Uh, I have nothing for you on that. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, the only people I'm willing to expend time trying to reach are those who are not already in the cult. 
I'm not a cult deprogrammer. And, and yes, I see the left as a cult these days. So I'm done with them. You can rescue your friends. I'm not going to do it. Um, I am interested in talking to independent-minded people, libertarian-minded people, and conservative people, many of whom see the same problems but are much more diffident and less confident about speaking out about them than a person like me is. And I, I know this because I hear from these people. They write to me. They write to me on the show. They write in the YouTube comments. They send me emails. They send me instant messages. There's a lot of them out there. A lot of people see, and there are liberals out there who see it too. I don't mean to say that there aren't, right? But they're not my concern anymore. That's no longer my tribe. Um, and uh, some of this is, is my personality itself, but I'm so disgusted with them, I don't care. I have no charitable feelings toward them. Um, and I, I resent being asked to have any. So I, I simply refuse. I don't. I don't care. Okay. Um, if they want to leave the cult... Because I was a cult member, right? I, I know. I was this person that I'm talking about right now. Nobody pulled me out of the cult. Nobody could pull me out of the cult. I had to leave it on my own. I had to make that choice. There were people and philosophies and books to read that helped me develop my mind beyond where it was before helped me to see a bigger perspective, but I had to choose to leave. That is the same for every human. So anybody who chooses to leave the cult and come over, my arms are open, honestly. Um, and I, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to make fun of people for believing stupid stuff. Cause I believed it all too. This, you know, I understand it because I was that person, but having been that person and knowing how intransigent I was and how literally unable, I was not competent. I had not developed the skills that were necessary to be able to hear people even talk to me. I know that it has to come from inside. Okay. Yeah. So well, how do you want to reach people? Um, what does it look like from where you sit, Benjamin? From where I sit? Yeah, because you're a different temperament. You're a different personality. You have a different approach. How, how do you want to reach people? How do you think people can be reached? Um, well, I I responded to ContraPoints today. ContraPoints was uh, probably the number one uh, YouTuber in this thing called BreadTube. They don't publish that many videos anymore. They transitioned and for some reason lost their steam or whatever incredibly well-produced videos hours long very well produced excellently argued stuff very left um and uh the new york times came out with an op-ed today about why jk rowling isn't transphobic and it's probably counterproductive to call her transphobic because that's seriously yeah this is the Times? The New York Times published this piece uh, that the new, uh, that J.K. Rowling wow. isn't she who must not be named. There's some nuance here, and actually it's counterproductive to the trans cause to, to vilify her. And ContraPoints, uh, or Dark Natalie, she's calling herself on Twitter, just said... Excuse me, calling yourself what? Dark Natalie, like Natalie Wynn is... Oh, 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 there. I'm sorry. And actually, let me correct myself. Calling himself what? I don't do... I don't, okay. I don't respect the pronouns. I, okay. I do they... Uh, yeah. For the sake of whatever. No, no, I'm just talking about me, not yeah. not controlling you. So all that Natalie, when responded to, was ratio period, right? And then all of their followers come and ratio this Twitter. It's like this. It's this kind of like a popular sovereignty. If we can get more numbers against this article, then we don't have to make an argument. We can just destroy it with numbers. Oh, okay. I get right? it. Ratio uh -huh. is when there's more comments than likes. That was it. a suggestion or a command. Well, it was a command. <laughs> it's basically ratio. And then like, look, you're wrong. Well, I'm not going to engage with your argument. Fly, my monkeys, fly. Very wicked witch of the West, but uh, our East. Um, uh, and I knew I shouldn't have done this because I don't want to participate with that community because they're all a bunch of followers. I, I would like to I, – Natalie Wynn is one of the few uh, lefty trans people that I would like to actually have a conversation with, not for numbers, but to actually have a conversation with sure. um, in this format. But I knew if I replied to it, I would just get a bunch of 
bullshit. But I replied anyways because I just had <laughs> I just published earlier today a uh, a two hour chat with a uh, man who has auto gynophilic tendencies. He really wants okay. to be a woman. He really just it tears him up inside. He really wants to be a woman, and so he's done everything that he could to research this because he knows it's not possible for him to become a woman. But he's just really compelled by this, and we just talk about his experience and his theories and the research on this what he argues as a sexual orientation that is uh, prevalent in a lot of the trans people. Male trans people are are actually living out a, a sexual compulsion to become one with their femininity, whatever. Okay. I don't want to get into that argument, but I just put that there. I'm like, you know what? Autogonophilia is not understood. It's repressed. It's a motivation, though. If we can talk about that and understand that, maybe there's better outcomes for everybody involved. If we can understand the sexual aspect of transition, basically. And I just okay. wanted to put that under Natalie Wynn's thing because I knew a lot of people would see it. And I knew I'd get a lot of hate. So I just muted it because there's no – and every response that was negative was no longer – it was all ratio. It was all like making fun of me. Um, or, or, or slandering me right. in one way or another. That's no actual actually, engagement No actual all. engagement. Yeah. So I, I wasn't, I knew I wouldn't reach most of those people. I knew I, I putting myself in, in, in the wake of Natalie Wynn would not win me any points, right? But there might be somebody who drop into that and just listen to me, just listening to another person. So sure. to reach somebody through absence of opinion, to reach somebody through curiosity, through, through, through a silence that allows them to start listening to themselves to, to allow to start listening to things that they're not supposed to listen to. It's a very long game. It's, it's the yeah. opposite of activism. It's, it's a, it's, yes. it's almost a psychologically manipulative uh, tact to take. Like I'm not going to have a position, but I'm going to listen in a way where you're going to have to listen to yourself. And that's what I, I learned that from the children. Uh, that I've worked with. It's like, you can, if I can listen to them in a way that they start listening to what they're doing, then they can start to go all along. I can urge that process of self-actualization or realization that you went through by giving them the environment to allow themselves yeah. to enter into that and say that, oh, there's a space here where I can listen and not just react. Right. And uh, yeah. And there aren't enough of those spaces. Uh, where people can just listen and not react. Most of the, most of the, there, there's, there just aren't aren't that many venues. I I think that even even when people, even when people want to have that kind of honest exchange that maybe isn't as rapid fire and maybe is more contemplative and and is is about actually two people actually conversing rather than performing for an audience. Right. There's very few places like even like right now, you and me. Right. Yeah. We're having a conversation. We've known each other electronically for, for a few years. <laughs> oh, I've we know each other electronically. How do you right. know, Josh? Yeah, exactly. Electronically. But even now, even right now, both you and I, Benjamin, there is a portion of us right now. We are both performing for our respective audiences because this is something that is going to go out in yeah. front of other people. Even if we don't mean to, this is just normally what There's humans do. I'm, a, I'm not unaware of it. Right? But there, so there, I think that, or maybe it's just, maybe I'm projecting. I might actually be projecting, but I feel that there are very few places where you are not, where I do not feel obligated to perform an opinion or not perform a particular opinion yeah. that 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 there's an audience everywhere right yeah. and i like an audience yeah. i mean th this is why i do this right yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. i do i do like to have people pay attention and i do get an ego kick out of people laughing at my jokes yes i do like the attention but not 24 hours a day not in every context not you know every minute of my life is not a show and but i feel like most of us feel that every minute of our lives that we spend in the digital public is a show. Do you know what I mean? Truman Show. We're all jazz uh, Some people would call it the Truman Show, but, but, but simply the obligation to perform. The obligation to perform morally or politically has crept into almost every space yeah, that we Yeah, the personal occupy. is political kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
Like there's no place we can go. There's no place we can go where we feel like we can breathe a sigh of relief and take off, take off the uniform, unbuckle our belt and just say, yeah. ah, you know what I really think about this, right? Without anybody watching us. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I published that interview today. I was talking about with the um, man who's trying to wrestle with autogynephilia and, and try to have an honest conversation with the trans community about that. Um, yeah. And I was really disappointed in my audience because 20 minutes in, they were judging him. Just like, oh, look at this narcissist. Look at this masturbatory, porn adult man. And he, we were just having a conversation. Like, even in this space that I've created, we're like, let's just listen to each other. And just listen before we react to that. Even that was just flooded by this reaction. And I know that a lot of that has to do with a lot of different personalities and the state of the trans discourse right now. People are being demanded to accept non-reality and stuff. But yeah, but just allowing a man to say, listen, my sexuality is really weird. And a lot of other people are acting, are, are, are having the same reaction, sexual uh compulsion that I am and it's not understood it's overjudged or it's suppressed the trans community is suppressing it and the anti-trans community is calling it a fetish we're not really understanding it okay even just opening that conversation it just just asking the audience to have restraint just just don't judge just a little bit just listen a little bit because that would actually help the comfort that would actually do more good and and make the other side be less radical and less defensive it's really difficult to do that it is difficult, especially I think it's when a tall... we're in a war and, and when children are being processed like meat. I, I understand the stakes are really, really high. They are. I understand. I think that. it may. Yeah. Well, uh, l let me tell you. Um, tell me something, Josh. I have not watched that interview um, that you just posted, but I did see it. It did flit across my computer screen earlier. I saw it. And I'll tell you that my initial internal emotional reaction was negative. Yeah. Um, my ref this was it happened instantaneously. It wasn't something I thought about. It was it was the reflex. My reflex was to be like, oh come on, right? But I but I do have a frontal cortex <laughs> that can regulate <laughs> these things, and and I said, Josh, remember, this is what Benjamin does. Benjamin has conversations with people. So that ideas can be explored. It doesn't mean that he is for the ideas or against the ideas. He's not doing anything wrong. There need to be people like this who will have these conversations. Remember, Josh, you want this to happen, right? Yeah. So that was my internal dialogue with myself because I had that initial emotional. And, and what was behind that emotion? The very same things that your viewers were saying. Look at Look at this narcissist. Look at why the hell are we platforming this guy when blah, blah, blah. Right. All of those things went through my head. Yeah. I think it's an understandable reaction because people, whatever side of this you're on, I think all of us do feel like we're at war. We are at war culturally. Yeah. And we, we are in bunker defense mode, whatever side we're on. Yeah. And we feel real fear and real danger, and we don't want to give an inch. I know that I don't want to give an inch. I don't want to. But I know that I have to in some in some places. But hmm. I, I think you're in a difficult position. I mean, why not be there? Why not go there? I mean, and, and, and there is a fine line between asking people to suspend judgment and gaslighting them. Say there's nothing wrong here in anything that you feel wrong. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's wrong to have that reaction. Sure. I'm saying, like, after that reaction settles down, there's a lot of stuff that we need to look at because this actually ties into male sexuality. Male sexuality is regulated by shame, and it should be. Shame, shame is the one tool that women, well, among desire, between desire and shame, that's how women regulate men's sexuality. Beyond, okay. like, violence and stuff, like shaming them or, or leading them on. Like, like, women use those things, and that's how we do it in a social environment. But there is... Male sexuality, if we want to, we can't regulate it to the darkness when it upsets us and then feel bad that it's not around to protect us, right? We, to, to really understand that the male, to really get a better, deeper, broader understanding. And, but my, my point is that 
it's okay for people to judge. And I have the same reactions too when I see things like this, right? And also, and I don't want to gaslight a, people into not listening to their intuition. That's a really important thing. Yeah, yeah, and f I don't think that's a subtle. I think there's a world of 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 space between those two things, but I think it's also a consequence of the of the digital architecture that we interact in. You know, YouTube, social media, other places like that allow us to react instantly and publicly. We are, we are entirely at the mercy of our own ability to censor ourselves. There are no structural barriers. There's nothing to stop me from immediately typing out my first vitriolic reaction. Well, and I've done it so many times. suspended over and over and over and over again on Twitter, freaking Right, and Josh. I still don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't learn nothing. <laughs> But but that, but that that's what happens though, right? Yeah. So yeah. maybe maybe a way to think about it is there may be a whole number of there may be a whole group of viewers or listeners who aren't showing up in those YouTube comments yeah. who yeah. are having that, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just there is a there is a clade there's a, there's a group of young vulnerable men who are not allowed to express their state their sexuality. Um, they don't want to, tra they end up transitioning and then they detransition and they were just like really sensitive and confused sexually. They're not homosexuals. Okay. They're heterosexuals, yeah. but their, their sexuality is just, it's, it, there's this switch and whether it's environmental or, or genetic, we don't know, but those men are very vulnerable and they actually have a lot of gifts to give to, to humanity. And, and when they're not uh, they are in our popular imagination associated with the people who are trying to like Leah Thomas their way into sports and trying to exploit women and contempt, uh, have contempt of women and want to own womanhood by becoming a woman. There's, there's this other, there's just this, this small group of people that need to have some place where they can connect with each other and not, not in a co-rumination, not, not in a toxic way, but to try to grapple with their sexuality and just have a little bit of space in the public not too much but just a little bit to say you know we're here and we're queer but we don't want to destroy civilization in our pursuit of our own sexual gratification uh fair fair i hear it i take it on board but another way to another way to react to this and uh, Frankly, I'll tell you, this is my reaction. This is an initial reaction, right? Remember, yeah, yeah, no, no, I have no. not listened to it yet. Yeah. And, and this is an initial reaction. I'm looking at the thumbnail for your video, and I see some, some guy sitting there with blue eyeshadow on and lipstick. And frankly, I just want to say to him, can you knock it the fuck off? I don't care. I don't care. Why don't you do this in your bedroom? Why do I got to hear about it? Why are you doing this? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Okay, so I don't think, actually. And again, initial reaction, I reserve the right to change my mind. Yeah. I know that I'm going off a visual impression. Yeah. Yet, yet, he does choose to give that visual impression. Yeah. Yeah. And I know I'm not sold on the claim entirely that they just want a space where they can be honest and talk about it. I think they want attention. So... Yeah. Well, okay, um, to, to, to bring it back all the way full circle, <laughs> yeah. Cindy Lauper, Janet Jackson, Paul Abdul, I don't know, you didn't say David Bowie, but like those artsy, fartsy Prince maybe, and were you ever into Prince? I don't know. But the, He was okay. I wasn't, I wasn't not into him, but no, no, my, my deity, my pop deity was Madonna. Okay. Um, I worshipped Madonna the way many many Prince fans worshipped Prince. Okay. So yeah, that's that's an interesting relationship because Ma the Madonna, yes, it is. like she has this. Uh, there's one documentary that she did where like it was behind the scenes on a tour. I remember yes. watching it because yes. I was hoping to see a boob, but I didn't get to see a boob. I was I was 14. Uh, there know, was full tits in that one. She took her. She she full tits to the camera. Okay, okay. If I you weren't watching, well, I was definitely Benjamin. watching, but I can't remember that. Maybe. Um, <laughs> 
But, you know, she has this relationship with the homosexuality and with gay men, gay men specifically. Yep. Like there's this really codependent kind of uh, attention uh-huh. circle going on there. So it's it's a little different than the- Madonna is our cluster B mother and our cluster B best friend. Yeah. Well, and, and then a prince or a Bowie is more autogonophile, like more I'm going to appropriate womanhood <laughs> and, and be the peacock. You know, I'm going to be feminine okay. and masculine kind of thing. That's a different kind of sexuality. And they're more- kind of straight even though they kind of play gay but they're more kind of yeah they're straight guys though but yeah. for them well i guess was bowie i don't know they're mostly straight though yeah it's just it's yeah. just aesthetically somebody showing up in blue eyeshadow but you choose consciously to not be flamboyant you are in your aesthetic presentation you're rather straight laced or straight edge right because you not because you don't want attention but because you don't want the attention to be on your aesthetics you want your attention right. to be on your ideas, right? So your aesthetic is yeah. aimed towards getting the eye to not look at you in a way, not not look at your Yeah, yeah, see, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you are perceptive. Well, I'm just trying to figure <laughs> out this uh, aesthetic reaction. When a man you, calls attention to himself by putting on makeup, there's a visceral reaction there because you're saying, I don't care about what you want me to see. I want to care about what you think. Right. Yeah. Uh, yes. You're. You're right. You are, and, and I mean it. You are very perceptive. Um, yeah. Okay. So some of it is. Uh, some of it is remembering um, when I was a young man. I was a teenager, a late teenager, um, and through through my college years, I was much more overtly attention seeking. Um, in my well, I was a clothes horse. Um, I, wa- I wanted to wear very fashionable clothes. I wanted to be seen as stylish and hip and avant-garde and, and all those things, right? But I also wanted attention in other ways. I mean, I, you know, many times during college, I would just simply get up in the morning and put on full drag and spend my entire day going to class and going yeah. around dressed like a 40s movie star, right? Um, and yes... Yes, those were the days when I was much closer to actually having full borderline personality disorder admitted. Huh. Yeah. Um, huh. But you know, young young people, young you know, young people are are attention seeking and na- naturally, right? Um, but a lot of us who come from abusive families like I did are emotionally delayed. We come to emotional maturity years later than than many other people do. So we end up doing childish things into our adulthood. Okay. Beyond what what other people do but it seems like that's become most of us in this society now so i want you know you're right i the when i want attention i want attention for the topic and i want attention to what i'm saying about it whether i mean of course because i'm a human i hope that you will agree with my analysis but many times people won't and i but i want them to know what it is and any conversation, including an argument, I want it to be an honest one where we're arguing honestly, where we really know what the other person is saying and we're not having a definitional war, huh. right? And I, you know, I I am, yes, I, I wish people were more conservative and straight-laced aesthetically. I wish they would, I, I care about the way I look, Right. I put on makeup and and put things into my hair before I do the show every week. I mean, I don't put on drag makeup, but yes, I do want to look a certain way. (laughs) Yes, yeah, yeah. Right? But that way is put together newscaster. I want to look and sound like a put together newscaster. Okay. Okay? I don't want to get attention because I bleached my hair or I'm wearing red nail polish or any of those things. But I think that it's not just I think that. I mean, this is just a fact. The way you dress communicates how you feel about other people, too. And when you huh. when you adhere to a certain degree to convention where you, you know, if you're going to a black tie dinner, you wear black tie. You don't wear tie dye. When you go to a funeral, you wear conservative clothing. You don't wear hoochie clothing. But that's all gone out the window. I want people to, yes, be be more conservative. Be more, be less flamboyant huh. in your adornment i guess would be my preference uh, oh okay 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 uh, we're, we're getting way off the weeds so we can we can wrap up anytime I know yeah you, i know. Play, but <laughs> but kelly j keen is so attractive 
And I'm sorry yes. to say this. She's just so viscerally attractive. Like, like not Madonna was never attractive to me, but she's just like this iconic attraction. She does. She, she bleaches. I don't know if she bleaches hair, but she produces, she puts a lot of attention into yeah. her, but it's okay for her be, to do that because she's, yeah, a woman. but, 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 but y- yes, but, and I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Those of you out there who say this is a sexist double standard. Uh, I'm sorry. That's the way the world works. Um, this is conventional for women. What Kelly, uh, like Kelly J has a high glamour look, right? Yeah, and yeah, she's, yeah, a, okay. yeah. she's a beautiful woman. I mean, you know, I can see it. I can see that she's a sexy woman, right? <laughs> but a lot of that, uh, and it's not just, it's not just her appearance. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's who she is. It's what she says. It's the way she carries herself. You know, she is a confident, self-possessed, fully grown up woman. Right. She she has charisma. Um, But her aesthetic choices are in line with even though they're high glam, they're in line with female conventions. My aesthetic choices of the way I present myself are in line with male conventions. Right. Women do have more. Whether you approve of it or not, (laughs) no matter where you think it comes from, I'm not making a value judgment. I'm describing reality. Women have more freedom. Um sartorially and aesthetically in or, that way. Well, I, freedom, I wouldn't say freedom. They, they have more freedom to produce, but more judgment if they don't. They have to meet Correct. a higher standard. Correct. That's then, right. But they can You're go right. higher with their standard of, of production. Yeah. But they have to... I could get away basically. I could get away with dressing down yeah. uh, and not get the same kind of criticism that a woman might get if she dressed down that same way. Depends yes, on how much cleavage, true. but yeah, 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 yeah. Well, there's still probably some makeup going on. I used to, I used to wear a lot of funny hats to, to confront, yep. to, to flout that, um, which was different than makeup. I've never worn makeup. I thought uh, every once in a while when I want to have Come like to Vermont. a non, non-binary s- stream, I, I was thinking maybe if I shave and put on makeup and my female guests can, can butch out and we can do a flip. So, Josh, you're Work is phenomenal. We've spoken. I, I don't know when. When did you start it? What year did you start uh, your 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 show? On the YouTube? show is just is just over two years old. Amazing. January of twenty one is when we started the show. Amazing. So what what is connected with this? Do you do any writing? You have a Discord. Do you do any essaying, or do you do mostly yes. video uh, casting? And I do it all. Okay. Um, so once a week, disaffected. Uh, we call it the TV show. I, I know it's technically a podcast, but I'm not going to call it a podcast because look at this. Does this <laughs> look like a podcast? No. Um, we do the TV show Sunday nights at nine every week. Um, we also do audio only episodes that are not on YouTube. They just come out in your podcast players. So, you know, you have to actually subscribe uh, to get the audio as well. Yeah. We have. Um, we have a uh, sub stack and uh, writing does appear there. I just put up a new essay this morning. Uh, so look for the disaffected newsletter oh, wow, okay. on Substack. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. And so, so uh, we, we started speaking about uh, junior high dances, but then we went into what's happening in Vermont. Is there any resources that you can point people to um, that I can link to, to get involved, especially if they're in Vermont about this addition of, of child transition under the uh, aegis of abortion? Um, if they want to get, well, what I can tell you that a lot of this is developing. Remember, it's just in the past okay. couple of days that we had a chance to see all this stuff. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If people are interested to know what, what's wrong with the law, the first place they should go to is our 15 minute. We just did a 15 minute, uh, video analysis. It, it's on our YouTube channel. Go to the disaffected YouTube channel. It came out this past Tuesday. Um, and it's titled do Vermont Republicans know what they voted for? That's the title of the video. Okay. That'll explain to you at least my analysis of it. Yeah. Um, if you care, if you are moved to say something about this, and I hope you are, go to the Vermont Legislature's website. You can get the contact information for every lawmaker in our state, all the Republicans, all the Democrats. Um, you know, write them. And for goodness sake, send a letter to the, I, I know it sounds old fashioned, yeah. send letters to the editor, to the media, any of the newspapers, the alternatives or the, the corporate dailies talk to, you know, don't, don't simply privately write 
to these lawmakers. Mm. Do something. Show yourself having this conversation in public, please, because it encourages other people uh, to have it as well. Yeah. And we're going to keep following this. And as soon as we know more, if we un if we hear about next steps, we're going to keep covering it too. So, okay. Thanks for those who are interested. And uh, where where's disaffected heading? Do you, do you guys uh, what are you guys focusing on? Like, I guess we're on a highway months? to hell. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, are you yeah. like like you, you're digging the Tr like you're looking at hell from a like commuter point of view or like, <laughs> yeah well now as the new transportation secretary i say <laughs> um, <laughs> um where's it going hopefully well it's growing uh we're yeah. gonna just we're gonna be doing more content uh we're gonna be uh you know it putting out more than one video a week okay well, uh, I mean, more audio so we're yeah. we're just we're gonna t i think I mean, we've there got any, a good like thematic core. uh like uh, like an investigation like a thematic thread that you you're formulating or you're following or you you generally are just responding to situation at hand um well we don't have a story arc because of course this is not a scripted fictional drama Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, you know, I, I find day. that, okay. you know, what, what we care about on the show is the abnormal psychology of our society that has become come to be treated as normal. What we care about is getting people to see it and be able to analyze it. So honestly, you know, it, it works. It works to react to, th to things that are yes. just coming up because yeah. it's all over everywhere, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, we'll certainly, as you know, there are certain guests that we'd like to get on that can look at at different sub threads of this from a psychologist perspective or from an academic's perspective. We'll be getting on there too, but um, yeah. Yeah. all I can say is stay tuned. <laughs> amazing, amazing stuff. Thank you so much for your time, Josh. It's wonderful. Thank you. I always up. enjoy talking to yeah. you. It's great. Thanks time. for having me. Absolutely. And